Hi everyone, welcome to Casual Watch Talk on this Tuesday evening. Well, we've got a bit of a, a special. We're going to talk all about British watches. We've done, we've got some picks, and um, but before we go into that, we might as well do some introductions. So we've got Jason from WatchRolling.com, my co-host. Hello. We've got Patrick from Pocket Watch Time. How you doing, everybody? And we've got a special guest, Mike from Zodiac Watches. Thanks for joining us, Mike. You're welcome. Again. Good to be back. Yeah, yeah, we loved having you last time. That interview was really good. So, thank check you. it out. Welcome everyone in the comments. Thank you for uh, thank you for signing. Well, why don't we do a quick wristwatch check, Patrick? You, well, I always start with you, but you might as well. We might as well keep that as a thing. <laughs> what, what are you wearing? Well, uh, today I'm I'm rocking the uh, the Dakva mm. Army Limited Edition. Mm. Oh, so, yeah. uh, my Tasty. weird ceramic watch from a fun little manufacturer, and uh, just a uh, love a good last forever indestructible watch so great little timepiece uh, enjoy loving it absolutely mike do you want to follow that sure i was wearing? i was holding my zodiac pro diver obviously uh, being on brand but the a big part of my life was bramon so i just threw on my bramon norton uh this nice. is the watch that i wore when both of my kids were born um it's pretty cool so i wore this it's been a while since i've had it on my wrist as well oh awesome awesome Jason, do you want to you want to go next? I brought out my Sunday special to commemorate Mike joining us tonight. My Zodiac <laughs> Zulu Oscar 9271 uh, two-tone compression case. Love it. Very nice. Love it. And then um, thanks for everyone who joined my uh, Whatnot live stream the other day because I sold all my other watches. So I've got my Rolex here. <laughs> And uh, also, I have got a British watch. So we're talking about British watches. I've got a CWC here, which uh, is on this bun strap. Um, but yes, we're in the old uh, Rolex date just this week. Well, let's um, let's dive in here. Let's have a look who's... There are more British... Wa oh, here we go. Some uh, marks. There are a lot more British watch brands than that. Yeah, and I yes, told them to... Yes, stay we, we, yeah, stay tuned. Okay, well, let's kick it off with, we're going to go through these. We're going to talk a little bit about the brand and why we picked it and, and a little bit of history maybe on the brand. And you might see me get a little bit hot under the collar under some of these because I have some strong opinions on at least two of these. But anyway, let's get started. <laughs> uh, Patrick, you picked Farah. Not I. Not you. Well, I picked Farah then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I quite like Fair. I know a couple of people in the um, on the Facebook group have got one. So Steve, who joins oh. us on the live stream, he's got a Fairer watch. Um, I, I just like what they do with color and everything. And I thought also their whole thing is Land Rover Defenders, vintage Land Rover Defenders, and they they did a few of them up um, as promotional items. And during COVID, they actually auctioned one off for the nurses and stuff so really cool british brand is it has anyone ever seen one of these in person mike have you seen one mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i know paul pretty well i see him out there on the scene and uh, we've spoken over the years and i think he's one of the examples of one of the british guys which i think you, he can stand next to all these different brands and be a friend to all i mean he chats there with don from vertex and you see him at the shows but when i met him he was just a very um intriguing character he, he wants to learn. He wants to know. He's also very proud of what he's got. And the one thing which I loved, and I, I think this is a big thing for this conversation on my side, is that he's one of those British chaps that can talk transatlantically. It's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. And the way that he has got his business really focused as who he is, where it's made, um, he's very proud of that. The quality is second to none. But <clears throat> I just love the fact that he can look to America and they get it. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's like a, a band trying to break the states, and he's he's got that number one hit. They know they know it and they like it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I actually love. I've often flirted with this idea of because this looks a bit like that um, vintage Hoyer watch, but this is their Mono Pusher chronograph, which I think just looks looks incredible. I love a Mono Pusher. Now I think they do complications really well, and obviously they do that flex of color. All the color that's within it is grand. I, I love when they just do that one bit of color that makes something stand out, which shouldn't work, but it does. They're, they're really clever yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. I've always thought they look like cool. If you're a pretty serious person, but it'd be a cool, fun weekend watch or a pop of color or a vacation watch to bring along for you. They, they do a pretty, because you know sometimes people are understated with their personality. They don't want to be too flashy. 
I think a, a lot of their their ones that are black with the color pops are really nice too. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's all about the color. Agreed. But mm. when you feel the watches, you go, actually, bloody good. And I think yeah. that to me is massive as well. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I need to get one in for review. I've always loved their um, loved their designs. Next one on the, this was my pick. I picked and I interviewed them on the channel, and this is. Uh, wt author they just do some like crazy mm. designs so these are uh they're designed in britain and i think they're they're made in i think they might assemble them in the uk as well but they're made from parts in asia but these are like crazy watches they they're not afraid of they're all they're all named after years and they're not afraid of basically they started off as a kickstarter brand but they're not afraid of kind of playing around with different watch designs and all sorts of things so real crazy brand that if you it's one of those watches that it's probably not for everyone but the peop, the person that does like it is going to absolutely love it it's it, it's one of those cool brands that has that kind of thing about it what's so. the movement they use what do they have on the inside do you know what? I think they're using, I think they're NH35s in this, but let's have a quick look in here. They're either that or they're uh, Miotas in there, but. I've never uh, seen it. And I've never heard of this. This is great to learn. Yes. Yeah, they're really passionate um, watch brand. And like another watch brand on the list that we're going to get to uh, later, which is the Studio Underdog, this, uh, the guy who started this, I'm forgetting his name now. He's going to. I'm so sorry. I think it might be Sean, but um, he started off designing watches for other brands as well. So he was designing sort of the like Ben Sherman watches and things like that. Right. And then when he started his own watch company, he just went he just went mad. He took all of that uh, sort of pent up uh, thirst for design and went went uh, went full on with all of these. And I think they they do they, they look awesome. So where's this fella from? Where's this company from? They're they're from the UK. The UK. Yeah, they're, they're from the UK. Uh, I wonder if I actually said, yeah, I interviewed him and now I can't remember anything about it. But there's a full interview. On it, would be, the... it would be quite interesting. And we've, I've not thought about this, but just regionally, where's a strong, a strong part of the UK that's building watches? Because I look yeah. at somewhere like Scurfer watches up in the northeast. So you look at obviously Bramon down south and you've got some of the periphery around there. But it's a small island. So it'd be lovely to see what you'd yeah. say is, is the uh, BLBN of, of the UK. Yeah, that's really interesting because at, at the time there was a lot of watchmaking, wasn't it? Because Timex were making watches in the UK, weren't they, for a, for a while or certain models? But you can also argue that Rolex was British in some ways, you know. Yes. Because, you know, there's so much to be said about that little island, but you know, it, it's called it's called GMT Greenwich Mean Time. So there's there's a lot to be said about time and timing. But when you look at something like this and design and fun, and the first two brands you've you've pulled up is not quite the stereotypical what you just saw over in the UK for the funeral. It was very, this is, this is very crazy design. This is not traditional. So that's quite cool to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 They're very fun. Yeah. I'm trying to find, uh, oh, I can't find his name now. Anyway, uh, we're swiftly moving on. <laughs> Next was uh, Patrick. This was your pick, but it, anyone yeah. could have picked this one because we love this brand, but it's yeah, fears. Uh, but... it's... Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, it's a pretty uh, pretty easy pick for uh, for British watchmaking because you know they they're just a it's it's just such a great story with the sort of the resurrection of the brand, but but more important to to me is just it's just a darn good looking watch. So I mean when I when I see this case kind of you know Panerai esque but with its own little sort of you know dichotomy to it, you know I just I, I just really like the brand, and you know they they. They make a good, solid watch. They're waterproof. As I said, I just, uh, you know, I don't really have too many bad things to say about them. And I'm one who will nitpick a brand. So for me to give you give you the heads up and the, the green light, you know, it's a good thing. Has anybody met Nicholas, the founder? Who, well, the owner. Uh, virtually. I've met I've interviewed him on the channel uh, <laughs> a couple of times. We actually uh, interviewed about this launch of the platinum watch that they did with the diamonds, just this incredible and the onyx onyx dial, but I've never met him in person. Have you, have you had the pleasure, Mike? Yep. I met him last year for the first time in London at, at the Watch Pro Salon and I watched him from afar. Actually, they did a panel <clears throat> and they had the studio underdog. I had uh, the William Woods team and, he, and, and Nicholas was there. He was actually watching the panel and they asked him some questions throughout, and he stood up, immaculately dressed, the most beautiful manners. 
And the passion that was exuded from him, I think, is the best of, you know, not just the British industry, watch industry, but also watches. He was perfect. And more than anything, he was proud to be that person that's carry on that legacy. And one thing that kind of drew me to him before seeing him, and I was looking at the back of his head, then I went and said hi, but it was his attention to detail on Instagram. It's not just the fact that he, I mean, we, I think we can all show some of our live on, 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 on social media, but it was the bits of where he was and the pride of how he took a picture and where he was doing it and bringing back some of the student, the design elements of tables and chairs, and then enjoying life with half a pint. I'm just like, you are a fantastic fella. He can stay. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, a really, he's a really nice guy. I chat to him pretty, regu pretty regular on WhatsApp and he's been on the show. He's been on the audio podcast I interviewed on here. He's actually going to come on the Sunday show as well. But yeah, I mean, just an incredible story that he was, his you know, he was, he was working for Rolex, wasn't he, at the time? And his, his mum kind of, he was around for yeah. Sunday dinner or something, wasn't he? His mum's like, oh, it must be in the blood because your grandfather or your great grandfather owned a watch brand and they had all this stuff in the loft, all this archives of it. And then he <laughs> span it back up again. Just incredible, um, incredible story can you imagine that yeah can yeah. you imagine that your mom's just like yo in case you didn't know and you're like what because when i heard his i heard his whole i heard him interviewed once on a podcast and i had no idea who the company was and just listening to a story and listening to him talk about it you know I, so i go look up the watches and i'm not a big you guys know i'm not a big dress watch guy yet but when i heard his story and the family legacy and stuff i was like and i looked at their stuff i was like man if i ever did get a dress watch like something I wore on like super serious special occasions. You know, I feel like, like Mike says, the attention to detail on everything he does, it, that the, the, the design elements are just so classic, but you can tell they're not like throwaway design elements. No. And I heard on a podcast recently, he did a launch with Top of Jewelers in America. And Rob said the reason why he loved him so much is that he knew he got off the plane from the East Coast after traveling from the UK and he'd already stopped before the meeting to set the time to Pacific standard time, just so all the watches look perfect. And I'm like, that's very Nicholas. And that's quite impressive. And also <laughs> slightly intimidating. Like that's proper attention to detail. We can all oh, be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then this is a tie in with a, maybe a future pick of yours, Patrick as well, wasn't it? Cause oh. I, this, this is an incredible watch, isn't it? That they made recently. The club. Yeah. I mean, this is probably on, top of my like last year's best of the year prize if i had one to give because you know garrick is another choice of mine in terms of just wonderful watchmaking because i just think it's so cool that they make bespoke pieces you know they only make about 50 watches a year and the fact that you know you can buy that for not the price of a house you know relative to what garrick produces you know they they make a really you know they're expensive but well priced for what you get machine and you know they took one of their more cool models with the the open uh you know escapement there and you know partnered with fears which put it into a bit more of a rugged case added the water resistance you know put some extra flash and uh some presence on the dial and you know really made the best of both worlds it it's a fears watch and you can see it from the dna it's a garrick watch you can see it from the case back and, you know, I just think that's really neat that they they played in the sandbox so well together and truly made probably one of the best watches of last year. That's great. Yeah, I, I was chatting to Nicholas after this and I was like, wow, this this watch is incredible. And he says, yeah, we, the only problem is, is we immediately sold them, or sold them all, sold them out. You, you, they completely sold out within, I, I don't know, a, maybe a day or so. But he was like, yeah, we kind of made all these watches, did the big band fanfare and then that they all sold and he was like which is fantastic but also it's you know uh he doesn't get to be the showman and, and pitch them again mm -hmm. but um yeah, yeah awesome brand we'll, we'll get nicholas on the channel and if anybody uh if anybody saw me just go slightly red then it's because the the uh, the guy at wt author i couldn't remember his name is actually called sam so i just <laughs> read the email back and i'm like oh god i can't believe i forgot he was called sam but anyway so <laughs> hi sam from wt author sorry that i forgot your, your my name your name um cool <laughs> what well, uh next on the list here is um CWC watches. I've got quite a strong opinion on this brand. But <laughs> One, is, is it? Yeah, is it? Well, so CWC was 
British military they were British military issued watches for for quite a while actually up until around about the 90s and now because I did a freedom of information request and they actually I think they're using citizen watches now but anyway but they still do sell they still do provide this watch to what's known as the 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 SBS which anyone in England will know but it's a special boat service which is the sort of um, m- naval arm of the SAS and so they still provide this watch to them but the rest of the brand was actually I think if you look on Companies House how it was sold was it was owned by the Cabot Watch Company is what CWC stands for and they were sold through a reseller called Silverman's which was an army surplus store and then at some point Silverman's bought CWC out and then they hiked the price of these watches up like nobody's business. I mean, they this uh, the the G10 watch as it's known, which was the issue one, that like tripled in price over the space of like four or five years. Uh, and uh, at one time, I was I was worried that they were just gonna that greed was gonna kill this brand off. And I would still think that, except I think over recent recent months i would say maybe maybe the last year or so maybe due to the pandemic they actually their price is sort of leveled out a little bit so now i think that they're actually not bad value you can get the mechanical versions of these watches for um uh, for around about the the thousand dollar mark the 950 which i think is about right for what they were uh so i i, I would be a lot more down on them were it for the fact that now their prices have leveled is out. It just think... price? Is it just price that made you go down on them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if you go back on the 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 way back, what it felt like, and it, this might be, this was my perception of it, I felt like they that Silverman's bought the brand. They knew how historically important it was as a British brand, and they just, like, dialed that thing up to 11. Because if you go back on the way back, uh, you can actually see the entire Silverman's website on the way back machine, and I've got some screenshots and stuff, because I was going to do a video on it, and then I decided not to, because I still want the brand to do well. I don't want, you know, just because I think negatively of it, other people shouldn't. Um, Because I do have a CWC watch uh, that was issued, and... um, they yeah, if you go back on the Wayback Machine, even like six or seven years, they, they these these G tens that they're selling for like three hundred ninety nine pounds were like eighty nine, and you used to be able to pick these up at antique stores like all the time. I used to go to antiques fairs with my, with my mum. Like we're talking late nineties, um, and they were like forty quid on eBay or whatever. And then it's suddenly overnight they went up to you can't get these on eBay for less than three hundred pounds now. Mm. So. I I was worried at one time that a great British watch brand with an incredible military lineage uh, was going to be destroyed by greed. And I think that's settled down now. I think it's settled down quite a bit. Um, But I would encourage people to check this out because I think that they're they're now, the quartz ones are still expensive. But um, I think the mechanical ones and and the quartz ones are probably. they're worth it if you like that history and they're extremely well made and they do have like this is the one brand that i saw on the list which is when you were you said that before we press record this is like got an opinion on these i'm like well now i know what it is i i've also got this little brand here that i can look at and go wow there's a lot to be said about a brand that got to a certain point the quartz crisis almost ruined it almost took it in a different direction I'm a massive fan of what they're doing in terms of consistency with style. And I do think that you find your way in terms of pricing. But I do think that when you were part of that dozen watches that were supplied to the Allied sides, you've got a place in history that can never be replaced. Yep. And I think that when you look at maybe the difference between some of the brands, even with Zodiac at the time in the 90s or the early 2000s when Fossil took it, it was a different brand. It was a different aesthetic. I think the one thing I love about CWC is you always know what it is, what it is where it's from, what it meant to history. And I think that what they're doing now is, is getting it right. And we've always got that kind of size and thickness and, and, and what it should like, look like in terms of stereotypes. This has never changed. It's always going to look like it. They do loom right. They, they have spacing of dial right. I love the yep. large numerals. Loom's good. Um, I saw it on Bunt that you have, Sam. I saw it recently with a friend of mine. And it's a great watch. It's very malleable. So I would say for the money this is one of my favorites on this list for value because of 
where it's from. Yeah, now I think that they've. If you if you look back o- even over the last couple of years, the pricing was all over the place. I think now that they, they've settled, it, now it's it's at, a, at the right level. I think, and, and you could argue that, um, you know, maybe they need to put the prices up to weather a storm or something, you know, financially. But now I think that they're uh, they're back at about the right price, and there's some real gems in there as well, like the yeah. quartz pilot watches. And the thing with these as well, um. Mike, is that the it was the quartz ones that were issued, wasn't it? It's not like I, there was mechanical ones issued, pilot mechanical pilots ones, but if you want to get an exact one that was issued, the exact watch, it is the cheaper quartz version that was that was issued. Which I love because at a time of the quartz crisis, these guys in many ways thrived. So there's lots to be said about it. I completely see why you can get turned off. I mean, being in the industry and being with British watch brand, it was one of those ones that. I didn't understand and I had to get out of it to look at it and go, actually, that means something to not just watches uh, in the UK, but watches overall, just because of where it stood within history during wartime. But I just think it's quite fun. Um, they don't change too much with color. It is what it does exactly what it says on the tin. And I think when you look at some of the instrumentation or, or how it sits on people's wrists, I'm, I'm putting this quite close to the top of this list. Yeah, the one thing, the only, the only thing that I wish that they would do is I wish they would bring back their because at one time these were like these even these quartz divers they were knocking these out like seven hundred pounds and stuff like that but they 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 bought it down to like a, a really good level and I, I just wish they would do more with the with the date on them because I think the issued ones actually had the date on them so. <laughs> Um, also, I like the date on watches. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> Sam can never like have a date bias. He might have a date. Bias. I have a little date bias. So, hey, I found, this, I found, oh, oh, sorry, Sam. When you, when you talked about the prices went up at a, at a period of time, right? That was by them, or that was by the market. They that was raised by their them, prices. I think. So, I, so I, Mike, I listened to your podcast with your interview with Ariel Adams from a blog to watch, and that was one of the things Ariel talks about is how some of these watch brands they get a little greedy. They make something good. They sell it at a certain price, and then all of a sudden they shoot the prices up, trying to shoot for a de- different demographic, and it can kind of ruin their brand. So yeah, maybe the like, pandemic I, gave them that time to bring their prices back down. Yeah, but it's also who's supplying it. What are the margins? What are the where are the parts coming from? What movements are they putting in? Um, I think that when you're looking at the price increases that these guys did, it was minimal compared to some of the ones that I spoke about mm-hmm. on that that podcast. There were ones that will go from a few thousand to silly thousand, um, and then you've got it the brands that you might think about later in this list and you're like, well, is it worth it? And then it's like, you have to understand where it's made, how it's made, why it's made. I do not have the skill set with CWC to give an opinion. I just know that when I look at the prices now and where it went, I think comparatively it was, you know, percentage wise quite high, but in terms of value for money, in terms of a historical watch, I think it's, I think it's banging. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, I might I might compile that video again because I got I did quite a lot of research on I did a Freedom of Information that. Request Act on um you know to to find out what the current issue was because they were also at one time flirting with saying that these that they they were military issued like in the present tense and yes the 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 special boat service user but anyway we'll move on um next one Jason this is a this is a favorite of yours isn't it this is uh, William Wood yeah. watches. Yeah, and, and I'll put some personal bias on here. I mean, I did a, I did a whole review of the bronze ruby, and I spoke to uh, Mr. Johnny Garrett, who's the owner. And you know, one of the most professional, just kind, courteous gentlemen I've had a chance to speak to was more than generous in providing a guy with his own little watch blog a chance to re- to review a timepiece and uh, the craftsman. You know, standard movement. But, you know, Johnny did a good job of explaining, like, we have to start somewhere. And as we move up, as we continue to have profits and make more, we can put better time, better movements in the timepiece. But I'm going to tell you right now, the overall craftsmanship of that timepiece, the upscaling of the straps, the upscaling of the old firefighting helmets into the case material, these watches, I will make a hot take that the renders don't do the timepieces justice. 100%. You have to see them in person. And it, I wrote in my little article about I got the bronze one. And there was a moment when I was doing something with it and I got it too close to my nose and that bronze smell, it was, it was visceral. I was back on a ship. Oh wow! I was back on a ship because all of our stuff is, you know, bronze, brass. Um, you know, the, I was a firefighter. We do the hoses all the time. 
and it was just like instantaneous. And, and it was the first time I've ever reviewed a watch that I almost just bought flat out. But I wanted to see what they do in the future with some stuff because he's like, hey, we got more stuff coming up. I felt like the the bronze with the, the ruby color would be just low-hanging fruit for me to pick. I'd like to see something else. But I'll tell anyone if you – I think the price is right. I think if if you are a firefighter or you have someone with a firefighter background, I know that's very niche. This – they're very well made, and I know they're doing a bunch of new stuff. And you know, if you like color, the cool thing about the straps are, I, I guess we talked about it before. I guess in firefighting in in England, it's the wild wild west. You can pick whatever color straps you want, the hoses, I mean. So if you want to have purple hoses, your your fire company can have purple hoses. I, that's insane to me, but it's fun. You know what I mean? So when you see the straps that have been upcycled, it's based on the color of the hoses that that fire brigade chose to have, and so. It's awesome. I just think they're awesome watches. And if you want something fun, but well-made from a good, and they have bigger goals, which you can go on the website and take a look at, but I think they're pretty cool. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a super fan of the straps. I just think it's so cool that they upcycled the fire hoses and, you know, just, crazy comfortable, crazy comfortable yeah. straps. You and having think some, of the, having yeah. some of the numbers yeah. and sort of the history printed on the strap, I just think is really neat. Yeah, his grandfather was in the fire brigades for 25 years. He did this to commemorate, you know, his his grandfather's uh, legacy as a firefighter, and it's just, um, yeah, pretty cool. I um, I met him uh, a couple of times. I met him at Watch Pro when I well, I saw him do his thing, and I went over and said hi to him in San Francisco, and we we hung out for breakfast in Chicago at Wind Up. This is where you get to meet some of these people. The one thing that I love about Johnny and this brand, and this is a complete compliment to him, is that he's open for growth. And I don't think that that's a disrespect to some of the other brands that will not want to sell inside of retail. There is a certain amount of margin. It's quite difficult to go from selling yourself to going into the wider world. I think he's got this ambition, which really excites me as a watch person. I think it's really lovely that he's got a balance of, this is a very niche story, but we all get touched by the firefighting community. We've all got our own heroes. And I think we all as kids think about wanting to be one, but what he does I think really well bypasses some of the the niche, maybe the naysayers, the people that will go, well, is this just a shtick? Well, if you meet him, 100% no. But I think that that genuine passion and reason why he does it comes through in the watches. And I think that's a really hard thing to get right as balance. So he's ambitious. He wants to look for retail partners because I think we all agree that you've got to touch these watches to really see how good they are. Yeah. And uh, I'm, I'm quite excited to see where he goes. I think he's, a, he's, he's the real deal. He's young. He lives in France. He's a very, very handsome young man, and he's in the gym. That's why I was like, oh, God, he lifts a lot, and he's all like – but you look at him, you're like, oh, you bugger, you're going to be really good. But he's <laughs> um, he's a real deal. If you ever get to meet him, yeah, I think you won't be disappointed. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I look forward to it. I hope they're wind up in New York. I think he is. I think he is, yeah. Oh, cool. Pretty cool. Well, let's uh, let's move on to our uh, next one here. And by the way, guys, if you, I, I forgot to say this at the start, but a lot, all of these brands, with exception of the next one, is um, are on this British Watch and Clockmakers Association, which was set up by Mike France and uh, Roger Smith. So there's actually a fa- it's a fascinating website. You'll see a lot of British watch brands on there. A lot that we obviously don't have time to, to cover now, but this is where um, a lot of the if, if you want to know the history of the British brands, etc., and which brands are made in the UK, you'll you'll find them here. Okay, so next one on here is uh, well B- Bremont and um, I have a. There's a few things about Braymont that I that I feel weird about, but Mike, you, you're welcome to change my mind. No, no, um, no. Listen, when you asked me to come on to this British one, I'm like, this is going to be a bloodbath. <laughs> right. So, uh, the, for, for the my view, I'll just give my quick view on on Braymont here. Shall I tell? Shall I just? Shall we just tell the viewers that I I grew Braymont for North America, the decade yeah. of my life. So. I, I left them a few years ago and we had kids and then I went back and then that, then COVID happened. So I've got a big affinity for them. I also do now see two sides. So I'd be very honest with you. So I'm really interested to see what you think. Yeah. So Braymont, I'll start out by saying that I've seen the watches. They are, they're awesome. This, this is the biggest brand that I, this is one of those brands that I want to absolutely love because it's British. They, you know, obviously they do a lot, but there's some weird things that that just doesn't sit. That it's weird things about it that I, I, I that don't sit comfortably with me about Braemont. One is that I can't. 
it's one of those brands where I can't I can't work out the price versus the spec of the watch. It, it they they seem high priced for what they are, in my view. Having said that, in their defence, they do keep their value because I've I've often flirted with buying one secondhand. Right. But the thing that really that I find strange about them, I'll say this in a diplomatic way, is they do a lot of. They're, they're very they're very big supporters of the British armed forces. It, that's obvious. But at times, I feel like they're trying to almost buy a military history that they don't have. And I know that they give a, an incredible discount to the armed forces uh, because I know I know ex-service people that have, have done squadron orders on Braemont. So they give incredible orders. They obviously do that one with the... The injector seat, where they'll if you if you inject from a plane, they'll they'll mark it. But so it, it makes me think. Well, okay, well that's good that they're given a huge discount. But does that mean that that's why the watches are more expensive for the general public? No, oh, ma- love this. <laughs> yeah, and then the second one, the second one, and this is the probably the one that makes me feel weird the most is that they do um, military watches that commemorate periods periods of military history they did it they do a second world war one this one is probably a great example of this and this is the the gurkha watch which if anybody's not familiar the gurkhas the nepalese army they fought with the british military for i think first and second world war same with the the sikh from the indian armies the sikhs fought in, alongside the british in second world war so there's a, a real affinity for the the gurkhas uh, and the sikh army in in british military culture but they'll make a gurkha watch like commemorating the gurkhas here and then it's like three thousand dollars and and the gur you you wonder serving Gurkha soldiers that earn the same wage as the the British soldiers. So it's not a lot of money. And like the Second World War watches they did to commemorate periods of the Second World War, they they invited a lot of Second World War veterans, but the watches were like $7,000. And you're thinking, well, what what are you celebrating where it's, it's, this is probably a generalization, but where it's likely that the person or the, 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 um, the people that you're celebrating with this watch likely couldn't, afford it or at least justify the the price so it's like are they trading off are they are they celebrating or are they trading off the 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 ip so uh, that's my view on it and that's why it's it, some of the watches i feel weird about but i like them in general and i want to love them so mike feel free to change my mind before i get into it jason gents both of you what do you think of what he said yeah so Sam and I have a similar opinion, but on a, I, mine's on a different watch brand. And I won't name the watch brand because, you know, I don't want to get punched in the face when I go to New York. But there's a watch There's a watch brand that sells a Roberto Clemente watch. And they sell a Master Chief Carl Brashear watch. Both are priced out of the range of anyone I feel would really want those timepieces. If I was, you know, my family, my, I'm, I'm Chicano from Southern California, Mexican-American, right? So... I, I just look at it as if I was a young Puerto Rican kid playing baseball, I can't, I can't buy that Roberto Clemente watch. Something I could aspire to, but you know, I can't get it. And if I'm a Navy diver, a, a young sailor who, you know, has been in a while who, you know, Carl Brashear is not just a, a legend in the diving community. He's a legend in the Navy, the United States Navy. That watch is priced out in my range and it's made exclusive. Now I don't know if that's the same thing, but I, so to me, it's kind of like, that company, I feel, is also kind of buying a little bit of a legacy. They're, they're, they He's weren't around. The one with Carpenter. The other one. The other one. Right, right. So, so, I. Now, here's the thing. I'm going to defend both know. of these brands now. I've got an answer for both of you now. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you might be right because you yeah. know we, we don't know the ins and outs, but those of all because because the thing is, I could go buy the Carl Brashear right now if I could find one, or the Roberto Clemente, but it's kind of like. The poor kid in me never leaves. He's never gone. He's always he's always there, no, and doesn't. and it's it's just it kind of feels funny, I guess, to me. And I don't know enough about Braemont, but you know, it, that's where Sam and I kind of agree on one thing. And maybe it's because I'm American and Sam, you know, has I don't, I don't know. And I could be totally wrong. I could be off base. I'm open to. You know. I, I think when somebody feels like you both do, you've got a very valid point. 
I would also say that there's a there's a second side to it, which I'll get to in a second. I want to hear the third opinion before I. Yeah, Patrick. Go. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a very opinionated chap, but I will say. <laughs> I don't have much of an opinion on Vermont. Yeah. The The only real thing that kind of soured the taste for me on Vermont was their introduction. They came in and at least at that time, they were making some very gimmicky watches with like a piece of an airplane as like a, a rotor or something like that. And anytime a brand does that, it usually sets off a, so is your watch not good enough to stand on its own laurels? Oh, and, I, this is going to be a three fight. I'm going to fight all three of you. Okay, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, okay. well, please. And, you know, the good news is over the last more 10 years, I think they've kind of stopped the gimmick, and that's good. So, as I said, I might need to give them another shot because they kind of they came into the scene, and I was kind of like, mm, why are they doing that? But I haven't really heard the gimmicks. Now it's more just they're, they're on watches and watch, you know, brand and good movements and et cetera, et cetera. So I think they're, I think they're adjusting and writing themselves, but they just haven't made anything that catches my eye. I mean, I, I say very often in my world of watches, you know, it's just a watch. And most of the time when I look at Vermont there, there's nothing there that makes me go, Ooh, that's interesting. Right. So that that's kind of how I feel about them now is they're, they're just humdrum kind of normal watch they're good. They might be a little pricey, but they don't have anything that makes me like peek and go, ooh, why'd they do that? And that's kind of like where I picked the Fears and the Garrick. I mean, like that that collab is gorgeous. And, you know, it's just, it's so unique. And I look at a lot of Vermont's watches and they just kind of look like everybody else's watches. So my, my bad is they kind of made a bad entrance. I know they're improving themselves, but they haven't made anything that is unique enough that makes me say, let me notice this brand. Yeah. And Mike, real quick though, but Patrick, uh, you know, I've known Patrick, he has a very, what I would consider elevated understanding of watchmaking. Patrick's background mm -hmm. comes from pocket watches. Patrick's owns some, what I would consider very high horology timepieces and not just on price, but on, the movements inside his understanding of the movements. Right. Like every time I talk to Patrick, I learned something that I have to go back and actually digest for like 20 minutes because I realize I don't know anything. I'm just throwing that caveat in there. No, Cause, no, cause I, Pat, I, cause I, Pat, Patrick's been following Patrick. I've, you know, been seeing what he's been doing, especially since we were on the podcast last, but I think that your first statement, Patrick was the one that resonated out of all three comments the most. Mm -hmm. Yeah. None of these watches meant anything to you. And I think that's one thing, which I think for a lot of these watch community people out there, where they'll find, some of the bits that you guys talked about and they all turn them on or turn them off. But for you to look at it and go, ah, it doesn't mean nothing to me. That's where they've done a, a bad job for someone who's as detailed as you. The one thing that no one talked about was the movement. One thing that no one talked about was the materials that go around the movement. All that you guys talked about, all three of you was either things you didn't like in terms of a price, the misunderstanding of the military, going back to your point, Jason with Carl Bushier, and then that understanding in there. And then obviously the limited editions. I'll start with the limited editions. When Bramon first started, they had a great chronograph, a great dive watch, and a great um, military watch. That's to do with the ejection seat, Sam. That yeah. watch was tested beyond any other indoor watch at that point. It was put on a Martin Baker ejection seat, and every single person who buys or, or who gets ejected gets a special um, price to buy a red-barreled watch with your ejection number, and that seat's never failed, and no one has ever died because of the seat. It was huge. Yeah. They did the MB version of that, which you could buy, but you weren't allowed red. I'll get back to that watch in a second. The dive watch and the chronograph were fantastic. Every single year, a few years after they started, what they wanted to do was showcase the passions of Nick and Giles. So they came out with a watch where they were given uh, or acquired parts of material from something really important. And every watch that they did, massive proceeds went back to that partnership or to that project. So the first one was uh, the EP120, which had a piece of... Um, it was called The Spirit of Winnipeg. It shot down 16 Nazis during World War II in the Battle of Britain. And that piece of material needed to be replaced anyway. And they put it inside of the watch. It was part of the rotor. That watch was at the time was, I think, nine grand. And it sold in the future for like 40 grand. But most of the proceeds of the big part of the margin went back to keep that plane flying. Then they did one, which was the P-51, which did the same thing for the American uh, Mustang, which is incredible. Those two watches are, for me, untouchable. I have this watch 
Um, I wore this on my wedding day. This is called the Victory. This is based off of the pocket watch that Lord Admiral Nelson was wearing when he was shot and died at the Battle of Trafalgar. This middle barrel is made of copper that was from the nail that held the ship together. The back of the watch has got uh, oak where Lord Admiral Nelson was standing when he got shot. And the brass, when it lines up with etching on the back of the case back, uh, becomes his seal. And the, and the words around on the wood says, thank God I've done my duty, which is the last thing he said before he died. This watch was 18 and a half thousand US dollars and a massive portion has got that ship still going today and it's a museum piece. They carried on doing that. They did it with the DH-88, which I've got here, which is the, the last and the watch probably the fastest plane to get from England to Australia at the time. Incredible watch. I've got a few. I'm very lucky. But the misconception, I think, is the big problem from Vermont is that someone like you guys maybe don't understand it, the genuine side of it. And it's because they have so many of them. So when you go to your particular example, Sam, with the, uh, the military side, a third of their business, a third of the entire brand of Vermont are squadron watches. And they do not give them a discount. It's complete opposite. They price them appropriately for that squadron to buy into them. So yeah. they don't make money off of the military. They celebrate them. And they've got over 400 squadrons at Trust Bramon to put their logo on a certain watch. And the reason why, and that goes back to all three of your points, is because the watch is built differently. The steel is 2,000 yeah. Vekas. You can't scratch it or dent it. The middle barrel is designed so the movement, even though it's only an ETA or a chronometer certified ETA, it's protected. There is an anti-shock and anti-magnetic Faraday cage. And the sapphire crystal has got 19 layers of anti-reflective coating. So there's no glare. So when you go to the price and you say, why is it five grand? It says, well, give me another watch that's five grand that does that. And there's not many. What Bramon doesn't do well <laughs> is explain what they've put into it. They try, but there's so much noise because there are so many projects and so many limited editions that if they just kept with, and this is my personal, beautiful, hopefully honest opinion, that the dive watch, the chronograph or the three-hander and the military watch, they're pure. They're very, very hard to touch for the money. And then it got all higgledy-piggledy with all the different partnerships they did. But I completely understand because I've seen it for a decade. But that's, for me, the problem of a lot of these watches that are not Swiss is because they come from behind the eight ball. They come with a new history. They come with a new sense of direction. And they, they're not from Le Loc like we are, or they're not from this beautiful Sweden of Switzerland. But I do think that that's where we should all go right. And this is CWC. This is Vertex. We'll talk about this is all the brands that are on this list because it's not a Swiss industry. It is the world. And we all have a part to play. And for me, and this is, again, because I was on it for the longest time, these guys will, are trying to do it so right. I just think there's one bit in everything they do it kind of gets lost from people like us, uh, which they need to get better at. There you go. I'm yeah. off <laughs> no, no, and, and I agree with you. They've definitely face palmed on a few marketing things, haven't they? Uh, like twice they've been caught saying things are in house when they're uh, to them. Yes, they designed it and everything in house, but it's not in house, mate. It, so, to, and then, and then I think with the whole COVID thing, where we use that example of fa fairer where they auctioned off like their one of their iconic Land Rovers. And then Braymont was like, oh, we're going to sell them like a sell like a 50 quid wristband with Braymont on it. And you're like, is this like an ad are you advertising Braymont here or are you, is that money like? So I think they could uh, like that G Gurkha watch, for example, that I was just looking at there. It says a portion of the proceeds, a, a big donation is made to the Gurkha Foundation. Okay, well, what percentage is that? I, I, I'm You've definitely changed my mind on it, and I think you're right. I think they need to talk more about the innovation because, to me, I just look at the price. They used to, they used to but yeah. there's so many projects. I mean, yeah. we had one year when we sponsored the America's Cup. We had Jaguar. We had Boeing. I mean, these are three incredible things, but it got so loud. And I said this again with all the respect. If Nick and Giles were standing here now, it would be difficult in front of the, your audience, but I think it's the right thing is that there's the, we, as this – particular junction in terms of you know the 700 watch brands out there and it's a newer british brand i would say that they should have they should have maybe held back a couple and just spread it out and it's tough because there are so many stories within all these brands that need celebrating but i really truly believe that it's just about that marketing it shouldn't chase the dollar or the pound chase the brand growth and that was always my job with them that's what i loved and it was it was always you know bite the nail ah it really you know i wish like you I want them to be better when it was part of the biggest part of my life. 
Yeah, I, I definitely will own one. There's no doubt about it. I, I'm just, I, I, they, they do keep, they, that's the problem is they keep the value big time on the user. So that is a huge advantage, which is an advantage certainly that my favorite brand on the list, Christopher Ward, certainly doesn't have the luxury of, of that happening to their time, their, their watches. But uh, yeah, I mean, we've got some great comments here. Somebody's asking, how are two British lads up at this time of night? Because it's a school night. <laughs> and it's because neither of us actually live in... <laughs> We <laughs> um and then uh, yeah so somebody's put I, I feel there is a way to do limited editions while keeping the price lower for making it achievable for people not familiar with watches which i think is that i suppose that's that's that was kind of my point with the i think it just really hit home when they, they had those world war ii veterans there and they were like oh we've created these watches but they're like nine grand a piece well, uh, yeah. what, though, i mean i had it we, we they did a watch with um bletchley park the place that um, oh yeah yeah and they they yeah, with a bit of crow bakers. And I actually drove a lady called Jean Valentine from Henley on Thames to Bletchley. And I've never been so intimidated in my life. She was 93 and she was sharp as a tack. She just verbally destroyed me for the hour drive and then squeezed my bum when I got out. But it was it was the thing that we did. And I say this at the, you know, I love this one, is that when you um, when you see how much that watch cost, none of them would have truly been able to afford it, or at least maybe not. But what the watch did is it gave back to keep, get it to proceed to make sure that that particular hut where Alan Turing broke the code stayed as it should. So what? certain things that sometimes get missed in translate or lost in translation, and sometimes these projects should be designed for the people that have got the name on the dial or the, or the, the project. But I would argue, and this goes to you, Jason. I didn't get to you on this one. That the Carl Bashir and all those different ones is. I don't know if those particular people who own that watch would have ever maybe even heard that story. Uh, I would say that there's a lot of the percentage you buy that type yeah. of watches that can keep that story going by the collateral that's in the package, by honoring the name that's on it. And yes, it's expensive. But my hope is that when you watch a movie or you wear a watch or you, you own something that's got something of history within it, that that keeps the story going. I think this Queen's funeral this weekend, for me, showed tradition. And I think a lot of the things that these watch trends try to do is elevate these stories to keep them going. That's just my yeah. two cents on that. No, yeah, I, mean, I mean, you, you made me realize something real quick. Just sitting here, yeah, right? Yeah. Like maybe, maybe I need to step out of my phone booth and not and not and not be so. You know, I, I know what my identity is, and I know where I'm at. But it's like, you know, maybe I need to take a step back. You know, take a step back for a second, and number one, read a little bit more, right? Because I easily could have probably read some of the stuff about Brain. I can't. I can't put it on Braemont to tell me everything I need to know about what they're doing. You know, well, I mean, I'm just saying, idea. yeah, I'm just saying, you know what I mean? And, 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 you know, they could, everyone could do a better job of explaining themselves. I, I think, could, I think this three was, of those was reading is if you read about them, you get their opinion. If you read the comments, you might feel people like all of us or the, yeah, these comments that they could be devastating because that's opinion. There's the middle bit where you got to find it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, when you hold a watch, and you say to the sales associate, why is it like this? And then you understand it. You can take it for what it is. And at the end, I would always say, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks, if, if you love it. The tough thing about this day and age of media and, and blogs and, and comment sections is that you go with hearsay and what's quite cool. I mean, I, we had a comment on one of the uh, bloggers the other week, and the first comment was negative. And so people went, oh, let's just be negative. I know that if that first comment was positive, <laughs> it would have been the other way around. It's just the way of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think actually to your to your point, Jason, I think Braemont, the bits that you've told me about Braemont now and I follow watches a lot and I knew every mis mishap that Braemont, that any face palm, like, you know, little silly things they do marketing. You hear about that straight away. But I mean, Alan Turing's like the pride of Manchester. I had no idea that they had a Bletchley Park watch because I would have probably been a that would have been on my rate. I would have perked up straight away if I'd known they'd done something that was inspired by Bletchley Park and Alan Turing. I had no idea. But the, the little rate wristbands and stuff that they do, or when they're, they're sort of like, oh, we're building a, we're building something for F1 cars. And, but it's just, it, it, anyway, it, I, I think no, they could I be doing a better job. It's of because the, the Williams side of it, it's, you know, Silverstone, it's the home of British racing. It's, the, I mean, they had people that work for Williams that helped develop the metals that go into building the cases. But it's so missed. It's so clouded because there's so much being talked about that it can be missed. Do you think That's it's a lesson for for newer watch brands, Mike, to be like, maybe you got, I mean, slow down so you can tell your stories. Like maybe yeah. you're putting out so much good stuff physically that your words can't catch up to your production, and then well, a lot I'll, of that gets lost. 
I don't know where this is in the list, but when I think about Don, I think about Vertex. That's completely what yeah. it's doing. We can I go think, there. Do you mind? I, do you mind if I say yeah. a couple of bits about Please, it? please, please, yeah. The Vertex brand is, again, a bit like the CWC. It was a watch for the Allied size. It was part of the Dirty Dozen. But what I love about Don is that he is one of the most interesting men in the world. He should be the Dosakis commercial. He, he is the man. And <laughs> you know, he's got his history in cars. He's part of Tesla. Yeah, he's... He's a, he's a pilot. He's right now in glorious Goodwood doing what he does in these wonderful cars. He lives all that's right about luxury and engineering and Britishness. He just oozes red, white, and blue coming out. And I love him for that. I first got turned on to Vertex by one of the Instagram posts. And it was actually a post of uh, a B2 bomber. And it was a post and it had all the red dots all over it. And it said, and I, please correct me if I got it wrong, but it, it stayed with me in the way all the dots were there was where the plane got shot. And so it said that the engineers, when the plane came back that flew, instead of concentrating on the places that were shot and had holes in it, they got to concentrate on the bits that weren't shot because obviously it got home for a reason and it can get beaten up. So it's always to look at something a bit differently than what you first imagine. And I went, bloody hell, that's really good. So I messaged him. I just said, I've never seen that perspective before. It'd be lovely to talk to you. And then I bought uh, this particular watch, the bronze version of the uh, the MP45, which has patinaed Beautiful. phenomenally. Nice. And then the more and more that I got into this particular watch, and I wore it literally for the entirety of COVID. It was my COVID watch. And it wasn't <laughs> like I was sitting inside in a pair of sweatpants and didn't want to wear a watch. I wore this and I loved it. And I fell in love with what he does in terms of the detail. And so when I spoke to him, and this is in the consulting side of it all, it was, well, what's your plan? well, I just want to sell through this and I want to make the best watch I can. What about the packaging? Oh, it's the best packaging. I'm sure it's these lovely, uh, these hard diving boxes and the straps are phenomenal. They work with these wonderful strap suppliers. And if you look at the knurling, if you look at the dial, if you feel the movement, if you turn the crown, I was just blown away. And the thing that blew me away the most is he didn't want to rush it. So we go back to that, Sam, what you said and what you you asked Jason is that he did this and he sold through and then he might have had a bit of a miscommunication because we had one of these particular watches in steel that was only for the soldiers, but it wasn't communicated well. So we held back and he learned from it. Mm. I think that this is the best example of British history, uh, quality, leaning into the Swissness of this industry as well with using the best you can in terms of materials, but then also realizing that his family history was part of a very iconic part of this world. And the new dive watch that he came out with, uh, if you, I don't know if you've ever held one, might be the best watch for the money in the world. I've never. Yeah, the uh, M60 Aqualine, I yeah. thought that was incredible value. I mean, if you feel the heft, if you see the loom, if you feel, if you see those, those hands move around. But more than anything, I bought into Don. I bought into his pace. I thought it was grand. I mean, I can get frustrated that, these people don't want to go into some retail stores, but he literally cannot yet because of how many he makes. When you look at someone like William Wood, where they make a few, but they, they have the ambition to go into stores and be more global. I think the patient side of what Don's doing now is the most impressive side of it at all. Yeah, I've def I've held the Vertex, the, um, the, the, the buy compacts. I've not seen the diver. It's interesting that you say about the divers because the renders here make it look slightly generic i, I would argue so it's a depth, it's good to have that view. yeah there's a ton of depth with all of these watches that you miss i mean we've got this mono pusher here this is me showing all of my collection now Hang on, it, on. it's the depth sorry sorry it's the depth within it which really is 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 missing yeah. and these these block markers are not just loom and painted on these are poured into the numbers and they're fantastic but the vertex logo the the minimalistics way of it i'm i'm, I'm a big big believer in what he's doing so yeah, somebody's made it. The Roar of the Tiger's made a good point. The high quality is for naught if you don't communicate what your product offers above all others. 100%. Yeah, I think that's important, though, to remember, though. That's, I don't know. I mean, are any of us perfect? Like, if we go back to yeah. a baseball reference, are any of us five tool players? Do we yeah. all hit for average, hit for power? Can we all run? Can we all throw? You know, and et cetera, et cetera. And I think sometimes, you know, that Mike, I was, I was up on my high horse about it tonight. And, you know, now that I take a step back and, and look about it, like, A, they can't possibly reach everybody. And B, I can't possibly read everything or and watch I everything. This, but I said this yesterday to Ariel in that podcast that you, you listened to was the, the worst part of this industry sometimes is they've got the blinkers on. Like they just know, they think they're so 
precious and everyone's looking at them. And so what they're saying is it's, it's an audience and everyone's going to listen to it, but they don't because there's 700 watch brands at the same time. We're on the forums or we're talking like this and there's 700 watch brands throwing all kinds at you. So you pick up the bits that you think might stick to you and you might love it or you hate it. And at the end of the day, it's got to look like something. And this goes back to yourself, Patrick. You've got to be like, actually, let's, that looks great. Yeah. It's resonating with me. And some of these renders don't do anything. So it's different. Well, the, the question I have for you, Michael, is how does a brand get a company to, let's say, give them that advertisement? Because the... The example I can think of, which is just probably the most magical advertisement I've ever seen, was Hodinkee did a little three-part video commercial for Grand Seiko, and they showed this most magical watchmaker. He was just the nicest guy. He was in all of his sterile things. He had his little finger cots on, and all he was talking about was how making a watch perfect gave him joy. And I mean, as I said, it, it sounds like a horrible commercial, but I mean, I watched the commercial, and I mean... I fell in love with the man and I fell in love with the watch because you just think now that every watch that they make is built that way. Right. And they and are, said it, they really it, are. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it, it makes you just want to hug the watch. And let's say going back to Vermont and Vermont kind of made a video that kind of said, you know, not only do we have this history hundred percent there or not, but we do make a really good watch and they kind of showed it. But how does, let's say, a brand like Vermont get Hodinkee to release that video? And that's kind of the hard part where how do they get the press that could help them? Well, the, the thing you'd say with Hodinkee is you've got to pay for it. You've really mm -hmm. got to pay a lot of money for them to put it to their audience. And also, at the same time, they're selling a, a ton of Grand Seiko and more power to them. They've helped that brand probably more than any other retail store. The difference with the Vermont is it's coming from a different angle. It was a, you're, you say the history is, you know, the hearsay it's two brothers. It's their dad died. That's what they believe. Mm -hmm. It's what they grew up with. So you can, there's people out there that have said, is it really this, that, and they've made fun of it. And even a guy said it to me yesterday. I'm like, oh, there was a crash in the field. I'm like, the dad died. Yeah, on dad died. On the plane. Yeah. How can you make fun of that? It's mm -hmm. just what they went through. The difference is, is, and I said this, the first Basel I was with them, because we went to every single uh, sales presentation or media presentation. At the end of it, I was like, how do you do it? You talk about your dad dying like, every hour. And they're like, well, his memories alive. Like, and so, yeah. but you can't sometimes put that across when you've been, you've put yourself out there to the entire globe and you've had a couple of mistakes where you, you sometimes get people that will make their own opinions and there's not the money that can go into yeah. Hadinki that can do that okay. effectively without the yeah. of it. If, if I think if people stopped and think about it, uh, where they collect comes from, where they've been, what they've been through too. 100%. The exact, the exact same as those two brothers making that watch company. I if, was. If, in, instead of being judgmental, they would sit back and be like, I, I come from my collecting background based on what I've been through. And I those two brothers you, started a watch company based on what they've been through. 100%. And I'll tell you the most personal story. And I don't know if I'm speaking out of tune by saying this story. I was at Oshkosh. Um, it's in Wisconsin, the biggest air show in the world with Nick. And the, the plane that his dad and him had the crash in, the T6 Texan, for the first time since that crash, because that particular formation stopped flying in the UK after that accident. And there was a T6 Texan uh, display team going overhead. And Nick stopped dead in his trap, looked up, and obviously a tear came out. And it's the first time that I'd have no marketing, no nothing. It was that one minute I went, right, everything about it is real. More than anything, because I knew it. But, but to that one particular person, and, you know, you've, we, we, they don't have the history. Like a lot of these British brands take away some Vertex and CWC. They're, they are building a legacy themselves. So the conversation then comes to, does it have to be British? Does it have to have um, all of this different history behind? Does it have to be Swiss? Does it have to be from the hills of you know, Mont Blanc? No, yeah. it's got to start somewhere. And the Germans, the Brits, the Americans, the Japanese, they've all got a part to play. And I am massively proud of what Bramon did. I wish it was better. I wish it was more well ran in some of the things that they've done decisions wise. But you can't knock the fact that the two boys have started it. They got a dream. They've got to a point. They're making the watches in the UK. If you've ever been to the wing, it's incredible. And I went to the first Christmas dinner and there was nine of us. And I walked in there last year and there was 140 people and no one knew who the hell I was. And I was like, that's fine. Um, I mean, we sat down at one meeting. This one little kid was like, so do you know much about watches? And I'm like, a little bit. <laughs> Have you heard of Vermont before? I said, I'm leaving. But it's, <laughs> it's just it's all hearsay and comments and how we feel about it. But for this particular brand, more than any other brand on this list, it is so controversial. 
And I think it's because they're ambitious. And I would also say, as an English guy that's lived in America, maybe you'll agree with this, Sam, we are a cynical bunch. And when somebody gets to a certain level, we're also really crap at bringing ourselves down. And I think that's one thing we need to learn from maybe the American psyche of bringing people up. And I truly believe that. So, Yeah, no, exactly. As a whole, Jason, as a whole. Yeah, so somebody put a good comment here. Um, uh, said, Sen sending off pieces to reviewers on YouTube is a great way to get good vi videos and publications out there. I typically watch. And that's right. I've never, I'm only tiny, but I don't know any other reviewers that have ever been contacted by Braymont, big ones that have, have you know, say, hey, do you want to borrow a watch? If Braymont rung me and said, hey, do you want to borrow a watch? Yeah, no problem. L lend it me for a week or whatever. I've never heard of any them doing that for any YouTube, they'll go on, they have their favorites. They'll go on, um, you know, Ricky at Scottish Watches, they, they get on very well with him. But I've never seen a reviewer review a Braymont that they don't own. So, well, I, 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 that was a few years ago, and I don't know what the policy is now, but it's all about the availability. And it's all very, it's every, every penny counts over there right now. But I look, I have James Stacey and Jason Heaton, the reason how I got to introduce them, because I sent a world timer to James Stacey, I sent a diving watch to Jason Heaton. And so it's, it's about the people that know the people. I mean, I think Jason's going to be massive. I think you've got the way that his podcast and his writing, and he can put himself down and say he's small, this, that, the other, but I think his message is sound. I sent him a watch to review. And now it's been published in the blog to watch. So I don't think I've got a magic medicine about it, but I do know I've got the trust from Zodiac to say this is 60 grand's worth of watches. Give it to the people you think can make a difference. It's a huge part of our budget but I truly believe it's the right thing to do. So I, I, I think that's a really value point. I think they've tried it. I think they also, again, you've got that blinkered thing about it where they feel like everyone's listening and they're obviously not. So yeah. that was a, that was a brilliant, whatever, how long that was. And I'm so sorry. That yeah, I we're actually, no, no. And if, if, if everybody's still in, in the comments, we can, we normally go for an hour, but I'm happy to, I'm happy to continue because we've got some other good brands to touch on if everybody else is okay. I don't know. Patrick, yeah, are you I'm all fine. right? Yeah, yeah, Jason. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go through. We don't have to go into this in in a, a lot of depth. This brand because everybody knows it's one of my favourite British brands, and that's that's Christopher Ward. I just I I love. I think they offer <laughs> the best value Swiss brand in that Swiss British brand in that price segment. This new C six C sixty three hundred that I reviewed recently, I was absolutely blown away by it. it it's also divisive because. Not because of anything they've done, but because everybody seems... It's a brand where whenever I do a video, everybody seems to have an opinion on tiny details about the brand. For ages, it was, oh, it was the name on the dial. And then now it's like people are like, oh, I, I like the name on the dial. For this, for some reason with this watch, they, they put a transparent case back on it, which was a direct request from their fan site. And the number one comment, <laughs> oh, I wish I had that closed case back on it. And it, it's like every 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 time they bring out a watch and a reviewer like me will say, this is incredible, this watch. People are like, but is it? But is it? Oh, uh, is it? It's like everyone has like a pre-made excuse why they won't. The people who, who own Christopher Ward know how good they are, but it seems like for a, for a large... Uh, contingent of people that watch Christopher Ward reviews they are they always have like a pre-made excuse that why why there's something about the watch they don't like it's weird and I only mention that because it doesn't happen on a lot of other brands um for some reason I don't know what it is about Christopher Ward, but I I love them Mike is just an incredible owner he's been gracious enough to be on my channel multiple times I love what they're doing the quality is up there but yeah. that's my little five minutes on Christopher Ward yeah well Sam you He's been see that's the thing is I haven't seen a CW that I like enough yet to get one right, but yeah. I've seen Mike France speak enough about the brand. So when something comes out that catches my attention, you know I'll probably take a chance because I know. See, and I think that's the problem is that we, we talk about this all the time about communication, right? Like when you talk about firefighting, the the number one thing you worry about is communication, how you get information back and forth. Everything mm -hmm. else sorts itself out, right? So I think a lot of these brands that come out and have, it doesn't always have to be the owner, I guess, or the head person, but as long as they have someone that can convey the story, yep. right? I, I think that's where you're, you know, how we talked, Mike, about the tunnel vision. Well, that's where your tunnel vision goes out because all of us are rationalizers. And if you tell me a lot of the story, well, I can rationalize how I line up with that story yeah. and you help me out. But if you keep the story, this little narrow path, you know, I might always be slightly out of it. Well, I, I've only met Mike once and um, he seemed brilliant. He was good fun as well. He was making fun of me with my time with Ramon. 
But the thing which I've learned since then is the, is the team. And they might not be, shall I say, for the general public because it's only sold in a certain way. But I do think that the team gives it a massive boost because they know they're doing it right. So I, I'm learning about this brand. I think it's got a lot to be said. They just started uh, sponsoring a soccer team that's not mine. So I've instantly got to make fun of it, which is massive in the UK. Um, Everton, they're doing that sound. Yeah. Uh, but more club, than anything, yeah. I, I just think that that might, the only thing that I would say with them and some of the other brands that we've got on this British list is do you want to be big online or do you want to be retail? And then for me, that's always just been in my my blood and my brain. And I think that's the one thing with most British brands is that they are sold in a certain way. And I just think there's so much tactility that's missing. And I think that yeah. this is probably the biggest brand that on this list that misses out on that. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more. The the render the the when they sent me that three hundred um uh because in the past I, I I they'd sent me watches but I hadn't got them in time to be released. I'm like, look, please, can you get me this one? Because I knew it was going to be good because I've got the previous version. Nice. But seeing it in person, the renders. I mean, they do their best to try and take photos, Christopher Wall, but the, it, you just can't capture it. The renders don't do it justice. Similar to you know Seiko and a few other brands where they look very flat but that light catcher case in person is is incredible but um awesome uh, well next up Patrick this was one of your picks and I didn't even know this was British I, I've seen this watch before but I didn't know this was a British British brand yeah well I said I just I like it because they're quirky and they're kind of fun and so I'm not really sure if this is the uh the cooler version of Swatch Sorry, Swatch, but uh, but Mr. Jones watches. They're kind of making a little bit of a of a for, foray into the world of watchmaking, and you know most of them are quartz, but they do have a couple uh, automatic versions. And you know, I just think they're kind of fun. I mean, they're they're not trying to take themselves too seriously, but they've got some interesting case dial shapes, and uh, some of them are ugly as can be, but some of them are, are kind of fun. And as I said, if uh, if if I saw the right one, I might uh, might buy one just as a fun weekend watch, and yeah, I said just uh, wanted to put something a little bit more fun and with a little more personality than the the standard fare we're seeing here on the English list because, you know the 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 English list I was I was impressed. I mean, when I actually looked it up, I was like, I really actually didn't realize there were this many British watches, yeah. and uh, but you know a lot of them are very standard you know, looking like everybody else a little bit. And so I just wanted one of my picks to be kind of the wild guy. And uh, I don't think you can be much wilder than Mr. Jones watches right now. And for I some reason, they're, they're popular. No, you've done amazing here with this choice. I think it's so unique. And design, you, you're you never going to find a, a British gentleman that's, you know, got a normal shirt or a non-normal -shirt, shirt within his, his closet. You know, there's always going to be something out there that's a bit different. And I think that's yeah. sometimes missed with some of the fashion and, the stereotypes of the world, but this is a really good example of that. Yeah, these mystery dial sort of ones are really cool, aren't they? Uh, yeah, they, uh, this is this is a, this is a cool one. Yeah, I listened to a podcast where they interviewed the, the owner, and it was just it was interesting to hear his his take and and why he does what he does. They're fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next, up, oh, actually, well, Patrick, this is another one of yours, and this is this is Garrick, and admittedly, I don't know a lot about them other than that collab they did with fears mm. well i mean they, they've pretty much uh just been building up they they started with their their s1s and go to their s2s and they're sort of just uh making themselves better each uh new rendition and you know they're just they're a really stunning watch and you know ah, that one is not going to go with my next line they're generally reasonably affordable <laughs> let's well, uh, let you, me let you, me get to it. You you pick the most expensive one, but uh, you know they've they've got some that are pretty much kind of in the the ten thousand dollar club, which for a a pretty much a handmade hand assembled watch, I mean it's it's actually a pretty reasonable price price point. You know I they're they're stuck on their their Garrick hands, which is sort of this old fashioned uh, sword style hand, and and I'm not usually a fan of that version, but because they're so bespoke, you can pretty much tell them what you want on your watch. So if you like the, the cross hands, you can have those. If you pretty much say, hey, give me some normal sword style hands, we'll do it for you. It was all custom. Mostly custom. I, uh, you know, I think they, they've got a couple that are sort of prepackaged, but, you know, they started as bespoke. And I think they're becoming less bespoke, but they still, you know, will take your orders. Do you know how many but of them make a year? 50. 
Wow. See that? Oh, wow, really? Oh, that's awesome. Because I get that. But I mean, the price point is huge. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, is that, you know, to get a, a, a watch manufacturer that makes 50 watches a year and to be able to get a watch for, as I said, there's there's some with fancy materials that go into the 20s. But uh, but I said their their baseline model is, you know, about 10,000. And I mean, you know, how do they how do they pay their bills? I mean, that's uh, that's not a lot of watches and not a lot of money for the corporation to make. And, you know, I think it's just really neat that you can get a bespoke watch and they they make very elaborate dials. You can see some of the guilloche work and, you know, the the movement. If you can find a picture of one, you know, they're they're just beautiful, you know, works of art, the movements themselves. I've never heard of them, so I, I'm 100% invested in learning more about this. This is great. Yeah. And so you know, so they're just really just clever all movements, and uh, you know, they're they're all their own designs. So it's just you know a an in-house made by just a handful of watchmakers. You know, they they kind of remind me of like an Oaks and Junior. So where they're they're just a really small team. And, you know, they're they're making something that's pretty unique out there in the watch world. So, as I said, I I admire them for it. And I said when they made that Garrick Fears collab, I uh, if they probably didn't sell out so fast, I might have bought one. But uh, <laughs> I, I had to get permission from the wife before I make a purchase like that. And uh, by the time I was able to say, hey, by the time I was able to take her out for dinner and uh, and butter her up a little bit, they were already gone. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Awesome. Well, well, next we'll go to uh, this is uh, Sam's asking whether we have mentioned Schofield watches yet, and, and Sam is <laughs> also from Manchester, so we'll, we'll we'll jump to that one next. We'll do a we'll do a request. Um, I don't know anything about them. <laughs> but, can, I, so... uh, can I talk a little bit about it, please? Yeah. This for me, when it first started, just blew my mind. Uh, the way that their case was shaped, the depth of it. Uh, the use of light, the use of color. This was not done by just a watchmaker, Giles. It was also done by an artist, in my opinion. I think that the way he uses everything um, to the attention to detail that he does can be painstaking for some of some of us out there. But when you meet him and you go to his little shop in Sterling out there in West Sussex, you will fall in love with the guy. I was proper starstruck when I met him, not because of his aura of um, any ego. It's just the fact that I think he's the real deal. I think that these watches are fantastic. Some people can always go, oh, it's expensive. It's this, that. I think this is pure artistry. Um, they are thick. They are deep. They are big. But that's not for everybody. These are for that person who appreciates what Giles does. And uh, I will say that this particular gentleman and this particular brand is the best of British. I think it's all not just, you know, it's not British flags or military. I think it's artistry. And I think that's what we've done brilliantly as a country. So, Giles, hats off to you. I think you're the man. And I love these watches. Yeah, this is a new one on me. Um, really, like you say, really interesting designs. Uh-huh. Go back to some of the early ones with the back lamp and what he did from a, from a lighthouse perspective. And he had some of the, uh, some of the. Uh, I mean, he had he does this really cool blog called I think it's the Pips. You know, he's, he's all very much about that way of communicating back in the day. And uh, I just yeah. think he's grand. And there's some really cool materials I think that are coming. Um, he makes everything himself. His clocks that you can see that if you scroll back up, his wall oh, clocks. Cool that you just see it to the left. It oh, doesn't nice. look like it's uh, anything. When you get it in real life and you throw it on the wall, this is a real piece of machinery. It's just the finishing that he does that, for me, is pretty hard to touch. Yeah, Giles, oh, yeah. I think I think this is like the one thing that's struck me the most and I'm going to try to take from here is that I just need to have access to some stuff because it's been the, it's been the game changer for me since I've started collecting is that once I have access and I can see and handle something, I've had opinions go up. I've had opinions go down and not necessarily down from a negative aspect. Just, okay, that's not something I would want, but it's great. You know what I mean? Or this is something I would, something I look at in a picture. I'm like, Oh, that's cool. But then when I see it, I'm like, no, that's really stinking sweet. You know what I mean? And then, you know, like when I held the, the Pelagos is the right way to say it now, right, Sam, the Pelagos, <laughs> when I held the LHD Pelago, I held, I held the blue Pelagos. But I don't even care. I know when I see the LHD, I'm going to buy the LHD, and I, I, because I, I got to touch it. And that's another timepiece where the pictures don't do it justice. The no. renders do not do it justice. Yeah. This one is all about. Depth. I would love to see this. It's yeah. grand. But this is, I mean, to a point like what Sam's doing, what you guys do with this podcast twice a week is, you know, it's a window to it. 
and the more we can have these kind of conversations that are open and honest and frank is that you then go, well, I'm going to search it. It's pretty hard in some of the stores, but then you go to Windup or you go to Microlux or you go to someone that might own it and you go to a red bar. I think that there's a lot to be said about this type of conversation because we can be like Sam might have his complete honest opinion about what he said with Bramon, but I think 10 minutes later, well, half an hour later, we, we came to a point where you might be able to see it and go, all right, let's hold it and open it because there are some mess ups. But for this one, it doesn't make many. Everything sells out. Everything gets reborn and refreshed. Um, yeah. And I think that it's his grand. I really yeah. like the case shape. Yeah, I mean, said anything, anything unique that stands out, that's a fun case. Yeah, sorry, Patrick. We got a super chat. Thank you, Canadian Watch Monkey, for the two dollar uh, seventy nine Canadian. It says check out the Steinhardt of Apple on. We're actually doing British British brands, and um, so but yeah. good watch though. <laughs> yeah. oh, don't, don't get me ranted about Steinhardt. <laughs> <laughs> you think I had a strong opinion on Braemont? You wait. Oh. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do a we'll do a follow up homage one. Uh, well, fromage as I call them. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, let's uh, let's. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, um, another one that I am. Everybody's talking about this brand. I've not seen one in person, but Mike, I think uh, hopefully you have. This yeah. is Studio Underdog, is it? it? It's Studio Underdog is the brand. I know that, but have, have you seen one of these in person, or have you met Rick? Rick? Yeah, I met Rick, um, and I've, I've I've held the watermelon version, turned the movement, had a feel. I think that, and this is yes, my God's honest opinion in this particular watch. I didn't have it for long enough to really understand it. I do. Th I mean, obviously, I'm with with Zodiac, so there's tons of color. And I know that you've got the strawberries and cream and they do these colors brilliantly. And the thing that I like about the color is how they've used not just the two colors, they've used a patina kind of feel to it. Mm. So every single one of them has a lovely freshness, uh, playfulness. The movement is not incredibly expensive. The watches are not incredibly expensive. Yep. What I do love about him is he's very genuine and he's a very humble young guy who started from literally nothing on this. And he's got a fandom and a following, which is deserved. It's all design. This, these movements, this styles, the style, the pricing suits it. When you get that design, it just makes it feel so much more than what those few hundred pounds might mean. So I just think that he's absolutely smashing out of the park. He's got a, he's got a really good recipe to, to, to do this right, and people are really understanding it. So sorry, yeah, that was a really cheesy thing to say. But I thought it was quite uh, – I, I do like them. I just have to hold them more for me to fall in love with the watch, but I love what the design means for him. Well, yeah. just like a uh, another brand that I like very much called <clears throat> Zodiac, they're doing a really good job of incorporating some fun colors into a watch. Yeah. And and I said, you know, I think that really makes it pop. And, you know, I'm kind of an anti-chronograph guy. They're not my favorite, but I absolutely, and maybe it's my OCD, love that they did the design where they put the names off center so that the seconds hand can rise up and you're not cutting through the name of the watch. Because that's my biggest pet peeve of all chronographs is that you've got this stick in the middle of your emblem, in the middle of your branding. <laughs> it drives me crazy. So of that's all brilliant. the of all the chronographs, as I said, I love it. And just because I can read it and I'm not, you know, accidentally setting my watch to 20 seconds just to have a stick somewhere else. So I, I said I, I like it. We've just learned a hell of a lot about you, Mister. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is. A, I, I'm definitely interested in seeing one. I, I know I've reviewed quite a a large, uh, quite a number of watches with this seagull movement in them. I know uh, it's a fan of uh, D uh, Dave over at Detroit Mint. He uses this movement a lot. I know that they they because uh, they it was the that they were a Swiss movement originally, weren't there? Was it Venus or something they originally called it that the equipment got sold off to China? I know that it's difficult to, there's lots of companies making them now. So uh, obviously he's sourcing them from a legitimate place, which is always where you worry about that movement. But um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I, this is, this is definitely like high on the list. I know people talk about this brand all the time. So you know, uh, Alan, looking yeah. at this video, I've never seen the website. Yeah, it's an amazing quality, video. The quality of these videos is unbelievable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I had to fall in love with how it's designed and the colors. And that mink choc chip one is number one wanting me to look at the watch, and I want to go to the freezer. Like that, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's incredible. This it's almost like this is like the Avengers, isn't it? With the uh, when he snaps <laughs> his fingers and the the watch. Yeah, he, he does an amazing. This is that's a lot of money's gone into that CGI. Yeah. A lot of times. Um, well, and, and speaking of that, in terms of it seeming to be a British theme, 
a lot of these watches are sold online and some of these websites are not good. So it really does help the sale of your watch if you've got a really beautiful website. Sorry. I was yeah. thinking of one company in particular. Oh, I, I was going to pick another brand, and I went to their website. Yeah. And the website was so bad, I was like, nope, I, I can't put this on my list. Hey, my, favorite you... German, my favorite German brand website. Oh, really? Uh, oh, Zin. Oh. Zin. Zin isn't that bad. Oh, it, it, it's all. Oh, it's... I, it, exactly. Yes. I will, it's 2022, I will say, Patrick. I will say that I agree with you, but I think that we've got a certain brand that I like quite dearly that needs a lot of improving as well. We've got a lot to learn about how to do something like this when you're a brand maybe a little bigger. But this oh. or this price, the newness, I think is incredible and a really testament to the watches. And I think that maybe is what this brand does brilliantly in terms of those mm -hmm. colors. He knows how to grab grab people's attention. And when you hold yeah. it in real life, I think that those colors really get pulled. But this has massively impressed me. That is a yeah. tech company commercial. That Absolutely. is an Apple, Samsung commercial yes that is it. and you that, want yes. you want the phone that they haven't changed very much since the last edition but yeah. you want I mean, to like, get in line to buy that phone right there right strawberries. here they're doing the zoom where you can see then the texture on the dial like yeah. that is absolutely brilliantly done because not only yeah. you see you know these beautiful strawberries but now you're seeing the contours on the dial and as a not even my favorite watch in the world but i love their press and i love what they're doing Mm -hmm. uh yeah and and uh, mike you're getting a shout out in the comments here if you want a pop of color zodiac is the leader <laughs> yeah you know, michael thank you very much we're trying absolutely absolutely um, so then we're down to our um oh we did schofield so we're down to our final two jason jason's got one coming up uh, at the end uh, next <laughs> one is uh, this is another brand that everybody talks about and i haven't looked into them a lot but i had a brief kind of summary of them now this is an, an ordain they do like lacquered dials it's a scottish company appears to be very well made i've never seen one of these in person i don't know mike have you ever seen one I've of these? Seen, I, if i'm honest with you i haven't i keep getting it um, yeah. on the radar but i just haven't had a chance yeah. to see it i don't yeah, know where to find right. it so. i think ricky and dave have talked about mm -hmm. it on scottish That's watches it. i've heard yeah. them yeah and, and I think it was Ricky said that you got it. You have to see the dials to believe them. You just well, have I'm, to really see them. I'm coming to Scotland uh, in November, and that maybe is the one reason. Obviously, Ricky and Dave, but I want I want to see this watch. I think the dial work that Dave talks about. I completely understand it. I've seen watches like that in the past. That this does not do the depth of what Dave talks about justice. So yeah, no, I, I get it. Uh, so and then uh, Jason, your special mention at the end was uh, Accurist. Um, <laughs> Uh oh! Just, just give me two minutes. Can I leave now? <laughs> I get it. I get it. I get it. But this goes back to my comment about just you know, maybe I'm just hung up on having been a poor kid. But if if I was someone young and I didn't know much, and which is kind of weird with the internet, but I think we've gotten so far down the internet now that people get isolated and they are probably less on this information super highway and more maybe like in the information shopping aisle. You, if you are so inclined to go learn more on your own you could understand where a lot of these design elements come from later you could you could you could learn and go forward and move and I, and it's an entry point for maybe someone who doesn't have a lot of money mm -hmm. because let's be honest about it a lot of people i've heard have these stories of i got in on x brand i got in on x brand and as i learned oh, awesome. more i learned more about the other brands they took style cues from and then you know that watch is maybe put away in a box because I have it and it meant something to me, but it took style elements from like the Speedmaster and whatever and whatever, you know. So I think that's a beautiful way of looking at they've they've nicked someone's design. But <laughs> but I do see what you mean. Does that look, everyone borrows something from somewhere, but that price point and an entry into this rabbit hole that is watchmaking has to start somewhere. And if you're going into a store that you know and you see it and you like it, buy the bloody thing. There shouldn't be any kind of um, people looking at that in a nasty way. And I completely agree with you there. Um, I've, I've never, ever looked at them because at that point it was always, I kind of went past it, but it was fossil and flick flack and, and you get into the sports watches. But for me, it was at the beginning when you said that on the list, I was like, I have no idea why, but your point is beautifully made. And thanks for saying yeah. that. The last Mike, thing I remember, I have a, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, Mike, I remember these adverts from like the 80s, the Accurist ones. It was like the gentleman wears Accurist. So I'll have to find those vintage adverts. But I remember, and they weren't a homage, a homage brand at that time, but at least they're like a, 
equal opportunity homage brand, haven't you? You've got IWC, you've got Nevada yeah. Grink in there, you've got a bit of um you know, like tag. You've got they, they did one that looks like a um we found one before, didn't we? Look like a oh there you go, you've got the, the PRX. <laughs> You've, you, they did one that looked like uh, Hamilton and, and Zenith there. They've oh got, my! Um, now, I've never heard Asheron. of this brand. Have, have they been around for a while? The, yeah, yeah, they're. they're, they're I, I, well, I remember them from the eighties when I was growing up. So, huh. yeah. sorry, Jason, I cut you off there. Mid, mid. No, no, it's and I, and I'll, and I'll, I'm pretty sure we're getting close to being done. But my last little nugget: I have a fossil watch that sits in my closet that I bought me and my wife when we purchased our house. We went to the mall because I didn't know anything about watches. And there was this really nice black fossil watch. It was a chronograph. And it had a cool, like, textured, half-textured, half-matte dial. And they engraved it for us for free. Wow. I was in and out for, like, 200 bucks. And I've been researching, just looking at the dial style element, or the, the watch's style elements. And I'm going to do a full article on my blog, because it's my blog, about that watch. <laughs> I'm going to talk about what that watch means to me. And how that watch is never... And I'm going to take glamour shots of that stuff. I'm going to put up the lights. I'm going to do the whole nine with that thing. Because it's never going to go anywhere. Because it's the day that I got the house with the woman I love. And it'll forever mean something to me. And are there some Speedmaster elements in it? Yep. Is there some other stuff that I don't know yet? Yep. But it's pretty <laughs> cool. And, it's, and it unknowingly got me into watches. Because I remember looking at the dial of this thing. This is really nice dial. It's cool. You know, do you remember? So, do you remember the fossil, like the British? I think it was British version of it. Storm watches were they British? Yes. Yeah, yeah, they were huge, weren't they? they late, were. late, early two thousands with the the big fat sapphire crystals on them, like the bubble. The one that had the the camera uh, lens turning to open it up to see the dial, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, oh, meet Mike. Can, uh, I think, some, can I just finish with just back to? to oh, yeah. I'm in the fossil headquarters, obviously where I am, and they do it right. I mean, it might not be everyone's cup of tea, especially we're in this world of you know watches that are in this particular level of price or um, complexity, shall we say. But what they do, they do bloody well. And C Coaster, who owns Fossil, you know, he's an older, old gentleman, more money than God, but more take more class than anybody I've met in this industry. He just said, "Well, we hope it will be somebody's first watch and maybe somebody's last watch when they buy it for them when you know they're a granddad." And I'm like, "That's great." And everything in between is Americana and design. And I'm like, "Good man." Stick where you are. Yeah, and Jason, you've just somebody's just done a real blast from the past for anyone that lives in the UK that it, it was Acuris that sponsored the talking clock. You remember that, Mike? <laughs> it's like yeah. the time sponsored by Acuris. Yeah, so you that. phone one, two, three on the phone, and it was the the time sponsored by Acuris. So there you go. On that bombshell, um, wow. you've you've hit on a bit of British history there, uh, Jason. Yeah. You no, know, uh, can I ask you ask the the panel just the one last question? Because yeah. I'm a big believer that this is a, a world's industry, but what do you think as two Americans of British watches? I mean, obviously these might not be everyone's wheelhouse, but what do you think of the industry outside of Switzerland? Do you think it's got worth? Do you see it more than just a flag or, or, or a place? Do you see it as a valid part of the industry? You can go first, Patrick. I've got an easy answer for you. I don't care. Yes. <laughs> That's the answer, though. So, it shouldn't matter. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I said, I I have watches from every major house manufacturer, country. Like, that isn't what gets me. And I mean, even kind of what we were talking about before with even history. History doesn't really get me. Like, I don't care if you're the first dive watch. If you're ugly, I'm not buying you. I don't care if you're the, you know, the greatest this. I, I'm, I'm going to buy you if you've got something innovative if you've got something cool if you've got something unique something that makes me go oh i like that yeah. and you know whether you're made here there anywhere you know looking up today's homework of british watches you know i realized that some of these watches were british like i had heard of mr jones but i didn't know they were a british company like to me it was just a kind of a new hipster swatch and i was like oh it's british and, you know, I did know Garrick and I did know, obviously, Fears was British because they, they tell you all the time. But, you know, I said, to answer the question short and sweet, you know, it really doesn't matter where you come from. If you make a great watch, I'm going to buy it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, for me, the more and more I get into this space or whatever you want to call it, it, it's coming down to relationships now for me. I mean, I had a whole podcast episode about that. 
that those are the real grails are the relationships in this, in this whole thing, you know, and it, I haven't seen one that that was, I mean, the fears, some of the stuff that I've seen in theirs, I mean, those things are great, but the fact that they're British, I think, well, I've seen them in videos. I've seen Nicholas in videos and that whole thing matters to me because it's like, man, like this guy puts himself that together. Like, yeah, I put myself together to go to work, but I don't put myself together like that to go to work. And so I look at him, I'm like, man, but I also would like to live somewhere cool enough to where I could put myself together like that to go to work. Cause I'm always warm, but me uh, it like to, just to piggyback on Patrick, it's, it doesn't really matter if it's cool. It's cool. If I like it, I like it. But the more and more I go, the less money I spend because I'm only going to spend my money on the relationships that I built because that Matt, I want, if we talk about these being stories, right. Vessels for our stories, then I'm going to put some stories in my vessels and I'm not going to have 25 of them. Hmm. Not going to do it. Not for me. What about you, Sam, as an expat? How do you feel about the British watch industry from afar? Yeah, I, I um, you know, I'm a big fan of Christopher Ward, but that that that, that happened. Where, I think they had a turning point for me, where they definitely they their design shift, their design language shifted, and that's when it changed changed the mind for me. And I think it might have been around about when Christopher Ward himself actually left. But um, so and and I I love the cwc because it's british and like i said i love the idea of uh, 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 the idea of braymon I, I i love that they're a british brand it does mean something to me that, that they're british brands I, th I think yeah um so uh, you know definitely interesting brands that we've covered it, it does mean something that it's a british brand to me yeah i would say which you know what straight after this podcast i'm going to go watch the great british bake-off just to remind myself of home and look at my Bramon watches and the things I did in the last 15 years. But Yeah, absolutely. Can we have absolutely. a whole podcast one time on crumpets? Because I really want to know the truth. What about am I getting, am I getting robbed? No. Of toast have you had a good one? or not? Not a real crumpet. Have a real crumpet. Stick a ton of butter on it and tell me that your life's better. Okay. <laughs> you, you can get crumpets. I've seen them over here. I've seen crumpets. I want already. a crumpet with this British person, Sam. Oh, oh well, eating a crumpet by myself is not going to do anything. New York, let's go and have some crumpets together, Jason. At one, okay. yeah. Let me. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll definitely at the wind up watch fair. I'm gonna. I'm gonna check out the flights now. Awesome. <laughs> well, that was absolutely fantastic. And thanks for everyone. Uh, 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 the vast majority of you stayed with us. We we went yeah. a little bit longer. Maybe we should just do longer ones in general. Thanks everyone for being. Yeah, just waiting for the flight. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The. Uh, <laughs> uh yeah no absolutely awesome all right well thank you everyone very much appreciated thank you to the panel and we'll see you on sunday's show thanks thanks everyone good night everybody right. thanks for joining us